Okay, like I said yesterday, I'm not going to be here today, obviously, so I wanted to kind of just go through this stuff with you real quick and then turn you loose on the homework rather than you just try and read through it on your own. So we are talking about polynomial functions. Um, we've been doing some things with polynomials, division, synthetic division, operating with them. Um, now we're talking about them as functions and kind of how their graphs work and how those graphs are different from each other. Um, a polynomial is an expression written as the sum or difference of several terms. So that's not anything that you haven't seen before. I mean, this is a polynomial. Right, it's, this, it's written as the sum or difference of several different terms, terms of different degree. Standard form for a polynomial is the way I wrote it, with the largest degree first, followed by decreasing powers of the variable. So I have x to the fourth first followed by x cubed. This particular polynomial doesn't have an x squared, so it finishes with x to the first, and then this one technically has x to the zero, but anything raised to the zero is a one, so it's not there, right? Decreasing powers of x. The coefficient of the first term is what we call the leading coefficient, as long as the polynomial function was written in standard form. So in this case, the leading coefficient is a three. Um, just some vocab, go ahead and pause it if you need a second. Okay, so for example, we have four different, five different types of polynomials. The first is a constant. A constant is just exactly what it sounds like, a number that's constantly the same value. 12 is always 12. The degree of this is 0 because it could be written as 12x to the 0. Right? The leading coefficient is a 12. In a linear function or a linear polynomial, the leading coefficient or the leading term is going to be a linear term with a degree of 1. In this case, the leading coefficient is a 4. If we step it up another level or another degree, we get quadratic functions that we've spent a decent amount of time on so far, um, with the highest power being a 2. If you go up again, highest power being a 3, you get a cubic function. So in general, this is what the form looks like. Don't let that freak you out. It's just some number multiplied by x to the nth power, and then as you go, the powers have to decrease at least by 1. And so it's it's just a large polynomial uh, with a lot of different terms. Typically in standard, well, in standard form, the first term is always going to have the highest degree. The degree of the polynomial is the highest degree of any term. So this is a second degree polynomial because the highest power in the polynomial is the second power. It's a quadratic. So on for cubic, the degree of a cubic function is a third degree because the highest power in the function is the power of the leading term, which is that 3x cubed. Now go ahead and, I didn't say this, but go ahead and pause this at any time too. If I, if I go too fast, you can pause and finish taking notes. Um, a polynomial function is a continuous function that can be described by a polynomial equation in one variable. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Polynomial equations that only include one variable. It's possible to write polynomial equations, um, well, let's just call it y, that have multiple variables in them. That's not what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about one variable. That's all we've ever done with equations, and that's the same for polynomial functions. Okay? The general form, the simplest form, is what we call power functions, and that's where we have some number multiplied by x to the something. a and b are both real numbers, and they're not zero, because if they're zero, it kind of makes things strange, and it's hard to make rules about the strange cases. So for example, f of x equals 3x to the fifth. That's a power function, the simplest type of polynomial that we're going to be looking at. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. So, for example, here's a question that you might see in the homework. Given that f of x is equal to x squared plus 2x minus 3, I want you to find f of 3c minus 4 minus 5 times f of c. Okay, and that seems incredibly confusing, but it's really not at all. It's just a bunch of function notation. The f tells you that we're looking at function f. It's just the name of this function over here on the left. The blue underlined stuff is what the input needs to be. So over here in the original function, the inputs are x's. So you see a bunch of x's in the function. This means that whatever every input is on the left, we're going to replace it with 3c minus 4. So I'm going to write f of, um, well, I'll still call it f of x for now, but f of x is going to equal now 3c minus 4, but because this was squared, this needs to be squared, plus 2 times, and instead of x, it's going to be 3c minus 4, 
minus 3. Okay, so let's go ahead and deal with this real quick. So we'll call this f of 3c minus 4 to be more accurate. It's equal to, we've got to square this guy, so think about multiplying it by itself. 9c squared minus 24c plus 16. It's just like I multiplied it out using FOIL. I just did it in my head. And then we need to distribute this too. So that becomes 6c minus 8. And then, of course, we have the minus 3. Now we're going to combine all those like terms, or everything that we can. 9c squared. I've got negative 24c and a positive 6c. So it's going to be negative 18c plus 16 minus 8 minus 3. So that's going to be 16 minus 8 is at 8. Minus 3 is 5. So this is f of 3c minus 4. But then it says to subtract 5 times f of c. So now I need to find 5 times f of c. So f of c, I just need to change all of these x's again to c's. This time it's going to be a lot easier. So f of c is equal to c squared plus 2c minus 3. But I want 5 times that. So that's going to be equal to 5c squared plus 10c minus 15. And then I said I needed to subtract those two. So I'm going to take f of, let's change colors real quick. f of 3c plus minus 4, which is this guy. Minus 5 times f of c, which is this guy. So minus, and I'm going to put this in parentheses so I don't forget any double negatives. And again, combine like terms. So 9c minus 5c squared is going to be 4c squared. Those are done. 18 minus 10. So negative 18 minus 10 is negative 28c. Those are done. 5 minus negative 15, or 5 plus 15, is 20. So that is equal to f of 3c minus 4 minus 5 times f of c. Just a bunch of function notation that tells us how to manipulate these equations. This is something that might be done when computer programming a lot because we know that we're going to be manipulating various equations with a lot of different inputs, but we don't know what those inputs are yet. So rather than have the computer do it every time with new inputs, we do it once with all the variables, manipulating it in certain ways, and then the calculator can just plug all the values in once it knows what they are. That's one example where this might be used. There are a lot of different families of functions. We talked about the different degreed polynomial functions. These are the most common. These are the ones we're going to be looking at. Obviously, you're familiar with the constant function, which has degree 0. Um, so let's write some examples of what these functions might look like. So this one could be y equals 3. Constant function, slope of 0, never changes. A linear function, we've spent a lot of time with those. Um, I should write this as f of x equals 3 because they're functions. We should use function notation. So f of x is equal to, I don't know, slope of 2 maybe, plus 4. Looks like maybe it's intercepting there at 4. It's got a slope of 2. Right? Uh, quadratic functions, we spend a decent amount of time with. This one's upside down, so maybe f of x is equal to negative 2x squared plus 3, I guess. That's maybe what that could look like, upside down, so it's negative. Maybe it looks twice as steep, but it's raised up a little bit. Okay, then down here, we start getting to the functions that we maybe haven't spent so much time with or haven't seen before. This is a cubic function, meaning degree 3. So this could be like f of x is equal to 3x cubed plus 2x squared plus 4. Uh, 4x or something like that. I don't know if that matches this graph, but that's a general idea where the highest power is x cubed. Notice that it is a kind of a different shape. We're going to talk about a pattern here in a second. Two new ones that are definitely new to you are quartic functions, degree 4, so the function is going to have some term that's raised to the fourth power, and a quintic function where some power or some term is raised to the fifth power. Notice how we get different levels of complexity as we upgrade the degree. So we start with a degree of 0, right here, and it's just a flat line. It's just constant. There's absolutely nothing exciting. When we go to the degree 1, we kind of get some growth. It's growing one way or the other. Now, if it's negative slope, it's going to be decreasing, but the line is moving. The values are changing. When we get to the quadratic function, or degree 2, uh, you'll see that we kind of we have a change in growth. It's growing, then it turns around and decreases again. 
right? So as we add a degree, there's a there's a direction change. Then we go to the cubic function. Now we have two direction changes. It's growing, then it decreases, then it grows again, right? Again, add another degree. Now we have three direction changes. It's decreasing, increasing, decreasing, increasing. It changes three times. Quintic function just continues that pattern. We change yet again. Increasing, then decreasing. One change, two changes to increase again, three changes to decrease, and the fourth change brings us back to increasing. So as we add degrees, we add turns in the graph, if you will. We, have, we add changes of direction, changes of behavior. Go ahead and pause this for a second if you need to, just to get general graphs. Um, none of these equations that I wrote necessarily match these graphs. I was just giving you examples, so don't take those as gospel. So the domain of all polynomial functions is going to be all real numbers. There are no x values that we cannot plug in. We can plug everything in. Everything's going to work as an x value. The range, however, might change depending on the graph, and we're going to talk about that later. One thing I want to talk about right now is what we call end behavior. What happens as the graphs go very, very far in the positive x direction and the negative x direction? As x gets closer and closer and closer to infinity, what happens to y? As x gets closer and closer to negative infinity out to the left, what happens to y? So I just want to briefly talk about the end behavior of these four functions. So let's just get a sketch a quick and dirty fun a graph of what these functions might look like. It doesn't have to be perfect at all. Here's my four graphs. I just want to get the basic behaviors. What do these look like? And we're going to talk about the end behaviors real quick. So let's quick sketches. This is quadratic, degree two. So I know it's a parabola. It's twice as steep as normal. It's lifted up seven, and it's positive, so it's opening upward. So it's going to be something like this, probably. Okay. Over here, this one's linear, power one, slope of four, y-intercept of four. So it's just a steep line, something like that. Again, I'm not trying to be perfect here. We're just trying to get a general idea of the shape of the graph. Here's another quadratic. This one's negative, so it's been lifted up, but it's opening downward and steep. Okay. And the fourth one, h of x. Linear, but it's got a negative slope, so it's going this way. Right now, it should have gone through the origin. That was my fault. We can move it, so it does. There we go, because it has no y-intercept. So the the end behavior is what's happening out here. As x goes way far that way, what happens to y? Well, y is increasing. Y is going up. As x goes way out to the left, what's happening to y? It's also going up. These two things are what we call end behavior. The, where do the ends of the graph go? In m of x, our first linear function, as x gets bigger and goes towards infinity, so does y. y is also headed towards infinity. As x heads to negative infinity, y also heads to negative infinity. Our end behavior here going opposite directions. In g of x, our second parabola, as x goes towards positive infinity, y goes down, goes to negative infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, as it moves out to the left, the y values also decrease. So again, in this case, the end behaviors match. They're both going down. In h of x, linear function again. As x gets really, really, really big and heads out towards the right, y is going down, so it's heading towards negative infinity. As x gets really, really small and becomes very negative as we move all the way out to the left, the y values go up. So again, our end behavior is opposite one another at the two ends. And that's kind of interesting. General rules of thumb for end behavior has to do with even and odd degrees. If the degree of the function is even, the end behaviors will be the same. So if the degree is even, for example, quadratics, both ends of the graph go the same direction. The direction they go depends on the leading coefficient. If the degree is even and the leading coefficient is positive, like the first example over here, End behavior is up both directions. It heads towards infinity. f of x, or the y values, approach, that's what this little arrow means, positive infinity, as x approaches negative infinity. So as we go way out to the left, y, or the value of f of x, the y values, are going up. As x approaches positive infinity, the function also approaches positive infinity. As we go all the way out to the right, the values of the function also approach infinity. Domain is all real numbers. The range is all real numbers greater than the minimum. Because right, this could be shifted up on the graph, and that would change our range. 
if the degree is even but the co but the leading coefficient negative, the option below that, same exact thing, it's just the opposite. Both n behaviors are headed towards negative infinity, but they're still going the same direction. If, though, the degree is odd, like the two examples on the right, so uh, linear functions, or in this case here in, this, in these graphs, uh, cubic functions, the n's are going to go opposite directions. If the leading coefficient is positive, we have a general growth up to the right, is how I describe it. Think of the slope of a line. If the slope of a line is positive, we are growing as we move to the right. So if the leading coefficient is positive, we have a general growth to the right. Yes, other things happen. We're going really fast, we slow down, we turn around, we might decrease in the middle, but overall the general growth of the function is positive to the right. So as x becomes positive, as x goes to positive infinity, so does y. y also goes to positive infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, way out to the left, the y values, the function values, also approach negative infinity. The opposite is true once we change that coefficient to negative. It just flip-flops. The general growth of the function is going to be down and to the right. Again, weird stuff can happen in this middle part here. We might go up and down for a second in the middle, but the general gist is way out to the left, we're going up. Way out to the right, we're going down. Again, you can pause this here for a second if you need to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and erase all this ink so you can see the original stuff in case you need that. And then pause it for as long as you need. And then we'll move on. So, you may have noticed that the zeros of a function also depend on the degree. If the function has an odd degree, so it's linear, it's cubic, it's quintic, the leading power of the function, the highest power term of the function, or the degree of the function, if it's odd, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, etc., it absolutely will have at least one zero. The function will cross the x-axis at least one time because the overall general growth is either going to be up or down. So at some point, that graph must cross the x-axis. Now, it must cross it at least once. It can cross more than once. In these examples, here it's crossing three times, and the second one only crosses twice. But it will cross at least once. If it's linear, I'll draw a black linear graph on here. It's going to cross at least, it's going to cross one time, right? There's always going to cross if it has an overall growth or an overall decrease. If the polynomial has an even degree over here on the left, if it's an even degreed polynomial, then anything could happen. For example, on the left, that's a really high power, but it has no zeros because all the ups and downs happen below the x axis. Just like a parabola that has no zeros, a quadrat or a quintic function quartic function, excuse me, could have no zeros. An x to the 6th could have no zeros. An x to the 224th degree could have no zeros. It'll look very zigzaggy like this, but it might be above or below the line. It doesn't have to have no zeros. In this case, we have three zeros. This same graph could have had four zeros if it just went down a little bit further. So you can have any number of zeros for an even degree polynomial, no more than the degree. If the degree is 4, the maximum you can have is 4. If the degree is 12, the maximum you could have is 12, but you can have anywhere in between. Odd degree polynomials, at least once. Even degree polynomials, you can have any number of them. It's up to the degree of the polynomial. So if it's fourth degree, you're never going to have more than four. If it's quadratic, you're never going to have more than two. But you don't have to have two. Odd, you have to have at least one. Even, you could have none. Again, take a second and pause if you need to. Homework is going to be day four. Good luck. Do the best you can. Um, obviously, you can look through section in the book if you need to. Uh, this is section 11 point, sorry, 5.3. Um, 5.3 in the book has some good examples. You could also check out Khan Academy and just Google um, graphing polynomial functions or just polynomial functions or end behavior if you're still confused. Otherwise, I will answer your questions on Monday. I hope you all have a great weekend, and I will see you on Monday. Monday.